Hi, and welcome to episode number 69 of Dreamers and Doers, where I interview people who follow their passion and use it to make the world better. And I think that's you, Mo Salim. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Alex. So I met you in Bali. And actually, when I met you, you had these glasses, which are blue light <laughs> looking glasses that I now wear here in Australia. And then we started talking a little bit. You came to a mastermind I organized, and then you presented at a, at a mastermind. And it's all going to be around how we can have high levels of energy without stimulants. But as usual, I like to ask my guest for his story and how he got so interested in what he's into, which is a high levels of energy. So what's the background? Yeah, man. So just uh, the long story short is that I realized that energy is our most important resource. Like we try to manage our time. We try to manage our money. But at the end of the day, like we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And I realized that because I wasn't functioning on those high levels where I could do what I needed to do, I would procrastinate. I would make excuses. And the main reason is because I didn't have that high level of energy. And once I was able to realize this, that's when I actually went down the line of getting hooked on stimulants, on Red Bull, on Monster, on taking pre-workout to go to the gym. And of course, it worked for a while until it didn't because your body does develop a, a tolerance to a caffeine, right? And then once it got to the point where I was had no more energy to give, basically, I borrowed too much energy from tomorrow, which I didn't have today. And then it got to the point where my adrenals began to give out. Like my body was just in a very high state of stress. I found out that I had low testosterone. And then that is what set me down the path of this, you know, making lifestyle changes, making mindset shifts and this whole path of biohacking towards how to actually experience those high levels of energy without being dependent on any external substances that would lead us down the path of experiencing high energy now, but then lower energy in the future. So what I help guys with right now is mainly increasing their energy levels. And it really comes down to making those changes in your mindset and your lifestyle that allow you to show up as the most capable version of yourself. Cool. Um, and let's get into it then. Can you explain? I think it was the, the seven uh, steps or hacks and if you can go quickly through, through them and then we can discuss them further. Yeah, so the main framework that I've found to be effective in myself and in working with clients as well has been like, first and foremost, it is your breath, right? Like body can, that's like our most important fuel resource. That is what literally we can't go without for more than three minutes. And breathing is something that we're never really taught, right? Like it's the most fundamental thing, but it sounds strange to say that we've never been taught it. And the main issue that a lot of us go through is that we're breathing through our chest rather than our belly, breathing through our mouth rather than our nose. And what this does is it causes shallow breaths and the oxygen that we're taking in, it's not really filtered through our nose either. So like fundamentally, if you can just start being more aware on breathing through your nose and breathing into your belly, like those deep uh, breaths into your diaphragm, that can like really change the game for you. You know, like even if you're in a stressful situation, like you're in the traffic, you are having an argument with someone like when we can use our breath as our anchor and really get us back to our center that can really help us deal with stress more effectively. And it seems like stress is actually the biggest factor that's causing so many doctors visits these days because we are unable to effectively deal with it. And uh, if we can get conscious awareness over our breath then that can definitely help us more effectively deal with the stressful situations in our life as well. So yeah, after breathing, it's really come, it comes down to what you eat, what you put in your body. And this is something that can open up so much discussion. I mean, we can obviously have an entire different podcast about this as well. But the way that I go about it, it's like the first principles. It's like, you know, with nutrition science these days, it's like two people can have completely opposing views, but they can have scientific evidence that backs up their completely opposing views, right? So like what what is the fundamental like i've seen that circadian rhythm is really what has a large part to do with how we eat so it's not only what we eat but the circadian rhythm is basically the alignment of our body's hormone secretions according to the rising and setting of the sun right because it's like since the beginning of evolution we have been uh having the sun there that is determining the expression of our genes as well so what i tell guys is like 
forget about everything else. Like that's up to you. You have to experiment with yourself. What works best for you? No, no one can tell you what food is best for you. But if we can really focus down on when we eat, like if we can eat our first and last meals at about the same time every single day, and if we can keep them within a specific time window, then it can really help us optimize our digestion and send predictable signals to our body whereby it is digesting when it's supposed to and it's burning fuel when it's supposed to as well, right? So food timing is a huge one. There's actually a book called uh, The Circadian Code, Circadian Code by Sanchit Panda and he talks about how our food timing is a large determinant that affects the circadian rhythm in our gut, in our digestive system and overall as well. So, I mean, feel free to chime in anytime you want. Like I could be going on for a long time, but if you have any specific I thought I'd let you go through the seven steps and then we can discuss each. I'm taking notes. Okay, okay, sure, man. So, okay, after, after eating, so after breathing and eating, it comes down to your movement. So again, like the thing is that I personally went through a situation where I thought that exercise is the same thing as movement. Like I could just be sitting down the whole day, drive to the gym and then basically do one hour exercise sit back in my car, come back and pass out. And then that's like one hour of movement. But like now it's come to the area where it's like movement as a holistic view of just moving throughout the day. Like I don't try to sit for more than 15 minutes, like set an alarm, move throughout the day because your body is meant to move. And the more we can move throughout the day rather than the, just that one hour of movement, the more we can improve the blood flow within our body as well. And the more we can stay energized because sitting obviously has a lot of terrible effects on your posture, on your muscles becoming cramped up and stuff like that. So, I mean, like I used to be obsessed with strength training and then I got injured and then I realized that it's more about the human organism in a totality rather than just any one area of improvement. So like I've been doing yoga, been doing mobility exercises, this flexibility exercises, strength training, calisthenics. So like looking at the human body as a whole, rather than just training one specific aspect of it. So then it's like eating, moving, breathing, and then sleeping is a huge one. Like I've seen that to be the biggest factor to determine energy levels. And you're also wearing these UV lights because they definitely enforce deeper sleep at night. So the reason is because we are exposed to so many of these artificial lights, whether it's through the laptop, whether through it's through the TV, whether it's through the phone, whether it's through the tablet, whether it's through the lights on the street, like all of them actually are picked up by our eyes, which then basically suppress melatonin. And then melatonin is what actually encourages our sleep. And if we're not sleeping properly, you can easily tell that you won't be functioning near your peak potential the next day. And that is when we begin hooked on stimulants to cover up the symptom. But the root cause is usually uh, low quality sleep, low quantity sleep, and that just disrupts every other aspect of it as well so i would recommend definitely like you've got these uv lights on at night and in the morning if you can get out in the sun and just gaze at the sun between like 6 a.m and 8 a.m that encourages serotonin production and then serotonin is actually what gets converted into melatonin so the more serotonin you have in your body the more melatonin your body is able to produce as well so that is probably the number one tip i can give is like get out in the sun between 6 a.m and 8 a.m so that you can send your signal to your body to produce the daytime hormones. And then eventually it will be able to adjust and produce at nighttime hormones as well. And the more time you spend in the sun in the morning, the less of like the less of a negative effect that the artificial light at night will have on you as well. Mm -hmm. So that's like a pretty big one as well. So those is are like the, the four fundamental. Is that the red light? I have a friend here, the, the guy who supplied to me these glasses in the morning. If he misses the sunrise, he has an artificial red light exactly exactly so these are like very popular in like uh, nordic reasons like iceland and sweden where they don't get much sun so they've created this infrared light which mimics the light from the sun as well and then you can send the signals to your body in that sense as well yeah okay so now we got like basically breathing eating moving and sleeping and then the next one is basically just focus all right now focus it has been like it can have so many avenues for it. Like meditation is what my practice is. But again, like meditation is a word which can mean so many different things to so many different people. So practicing focus is for me personally just means to sit in my place of silence and focus on a point, whether that's my breath, whether that's something in front of me, whether that's like my third eye chakra, like whatever area I'm trying to focus on. It's like just keeping an area of focus and then sticking to it 
over an extended period of time. And then every time I have this thought chatter come in, that is a signal for me to get back to the center. And then the more I can get back to the center with my practice, the more I'm able to exercise the muscle of my focus. And I've seen the effects of this. Like before, I could barely even focus for like 10, 15 minutes on my work. Now it's like 50 minutes and even more, but I just get up because I want to move. So training your focus, like most people are not focus is a muscle and the more energy we have the more we can focus and the more we exercise our focus the more we can allocate our energy effectively as well so yeah and uh, the next step in this blueprint is hormesis which is basically the opposite of distress all right so we have distress and then hormesis is you stress which is basically positive stress so distress is when we get caught in that cycle of negative thought and negative emotions whereby we're replaying the events in our head again and again that causes our hormones to be released like high levels of cortisol that really just damages our well-being but with the hormetic stress it's like the short-term stress like for example going into a cold shower which i put this morning as well and just be giving your body that stress and then it, your body is adapting to deal with that stress more effectively. So it basically boosts your resilience, which is the ability to bounce back from stress. So for me, the example that I give is like, I start my days with cold showers. And if some, if I get stressed out on the street, if someone is saying something to me, if something is triggering me, then I might fall off center, but I'm immediately able to get back very fast. I don't go through the cycle again and again, because I am more adjusted to dealing with the stress in my life. And that's what you stress does. I mean, lifting weights is you stress, like you break down the muscle and then it grows down stronger as a result as well. So just putting yourself into these uncomfortable situations, which allow you to get stronger, which allow you to express courage rather than getting caught in the cycle of so much comfort where like literally anything we could ever need is just a button away. Right? So we've come to the point where technology has advanced way faster than our evolution has had the chance to keep up with. So we have to take responsibility for our own evolution by putting ourselves into these uncomfortable situations, which then allow us to grow as a result of it. And then the final step is really, it has been a game changer for me for sure. And that is basically the practice of semen retention. So not letting your life force go, like everyone would agree that it takes energy to create an entire new life. So if you're just ejaculating, if you're letting your life force go in your tissue paper or your sheets or your flush, whatever it is, it's like you're literally leaving that body within your body, with, leaving that energy within your body. So the more we can retain that energy and channel it through our chakras, up the sacrum, towards the spine, up the head, the more we can keep that energy for ourselves, heal the rest of our body and enhance our levels of creativity as well so that's the huge one because the pornography addiction is something that i've seen like as i've created more and more content like i make a video on how to you know find your life's purpose that doesn't get as many views as making a video on like how, how to stop faffing or something like that so it seems to be a problem that a lot of guys are going through these days so that's like and another problem is that once guys actually go through no fab they think that ejaculation and orgasm is the same thing which is really the point of frustration which i went through myself like i did no fat for more than like 180 days and i just had this energy inside me whether it was like frustration whether it was anger whether it was just this built up rage that i was judging other people through that and stuff and that's because the sexual energy was not actually transmuted it was just there mm. it was not expressed and it was just coming out as this uh, negative energy out there so see excuse me, semen retention is really the practice of channeling that energy within our body so that we can use it for enhanced levels of consciousness, awareness, creativity, and all of that good stuff. So yeah, that's the gist of the seven step blueprint. Obviously we can like do entire separate episodes on each step, but that's just- That's, uh, that's exactly just why I didn't want to stop you. It's like, otherwise we would never have gone to, to seven. Each of them could be an entire podcast. And that's super interesting. Exactly, yeah. um, I love having you also because- you sometimes with biohackers you get a bit lost into take this at that time and i love how you prioritize those simple things around breath breath and eating movement sleep focus little stress and sexual energy you know it's like it's very um aligned with with nature in a way and and, and very simple and i i do agree that those simple things are probably the most important and then if you want to do the little adjustments that's great but it doesn't make sense to spend thousands of dollars on fancy supplements when you don't sleep enough, right? Exactly. 
Uh, just on point number seven, obviously that's mainly for men. Is there an equivalent for women? Yeah, so like in the Taoist text and Tantric text, they talk a lot about how it's kind of different for women because women, like, women are naturally multi-orgasmic. They only let their egg loose like once a month, right? So there are different practices, but the gist of, like my focus is just on guys because like guys can just ejaculate every single day, right? With mm -hmm. women, it's like they are naturally multi-orgasmic. They're naturally more in touch with their sexual energy as well. Mm -hmm. So the practices are different. I'm not aware of exactly what that they are, but I'm sure okay. I can, uh, Mantak Chia has a lot of books. So he has, he's creating a lot of content for women and men both. So we can probably link out to that in the resources section. Okay. And, and for men, you definitely advise to always keep your energy or is it like once a week, it's, it's good to release? <laughs> yeah, so it really depends. It depends on your personal situation, how old you are, like how you feel. Like personally, I have not let it loose for a while, like more than a couple of months. But at the bare minimum, if you do feel the urge, if you're not uh, practiced in this, because it does take time. It's not something that happens overnight. Like we've been conditioning ourselves to basically associate ejaculation with orgasm as being the same thing and then if you are with a, with your partner or if you are practicing solo cultivation it can become hard to actually hold it back so mm -hmm. even if you are practicing and you do let loose then there are some strategies that you can use to reduce the damages of that but uh mantak chia recommends that you should uh like keep it below you know four times a month if you're like in your 20s okay. and if you're in your 30s it should be like three times and then if you're in your 40s like the older you get he recommends that the more you should retain your semen so okay. yeah it's and, and personal practice. does that come with a practice like uh, in tantra that's actually what i've been doing more lately it's like you take a an hour when you have a self-pleasure or even with a partner and you're going to take an hour and not come and uh, that's actually uh, yeah it's, it's even harder than uh, like if you think ice baths are hard like try that <laughs> but is it like a yeah, practice exactly. then that you encourage people to do yeah exactly like you said an hour i'm usually encourage you guys for like 20 minutes if they can do it for okay. 20 minutes they can usually do it for an hour as well so the main thing is, uh, yeah, just practicing using whatever oil you want to use and just lubricating it. And then, if, I mean, this is for the practice of solo cultivation, obviously. And it's much harder when you're with a partner because it's, uh, you know, the emotions are way more aroused. But if we can get to the point where we can pleasure ourselves for like 20 minutes or even 15 minutes, then we can get to the point where we can actually last longer when, we're the, when we are with our partner as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the practice is basically... That's like cultivation, solo cultivation is what they call it in Taoism. So like basically expressing. And it really comes down to the lens through which you do it, right? Because when I was caught in the, in the, NoFab, in the NoFab paradigm, it was like, yo, just masturbation is really bad. You should never do it. And hmm. It comes down to where you're doing it from. Like if you're doing it as an escape, as a distraction, as a, and you associate emotions of guilt and shame with it, then that's not going to be the same thing as when you're like, basically making love to yourself right it's yeah. going to be two totally different frames that you're coming at it from even though you're doing the same thing so that would be like the first step like change your association that you have with masturbation and then as you practice the solo cultivation like the most important practice is the pc muscle right that's the muscle that we use to pee and to stop our piss mm -hmm. so if we can exercise that i can actually recommend an application for that as well there's like an iphone app for that practice these kegels every single day yeah. then you can really strengthen that muscle and then have more control over when uh the moment of ejaculation and orgasm like it can, it can go one of two ways either you go in the way of like multiple orgasms whereby you retain that and you can build upon it and it gets more intense and more intense to the point where it can literally become like a transcendent experience if you've <laughs> experienced that before like you know the like you're at one with the universe at one with your partner like the division between subject and object disappear and then obviously the more we practice, otherwise it can just seep into ejaculation and then everything ends. So it's like building it up versus just like getting to a peak yeah. and then falling down. So there's a lot of practices that go into it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually um, there are a lot of yogic practices, even not relating to sex that use the channeling of sexual energy. Some of the, some of my breath work I do is about doing these kegels and shooting the energy um, up, up the spine, you know, even uh, so 
and even like Nap Napoleon Hill in uh, um, Think and Grow Rich talks a lot about that sexual energy. That's something that's been used a lot by business people and that's really recognized as being a, a really creative source, uh, a, a powerful source of creativity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I tell guys that sexual energy is the same thing as your creative energy. Like our drive to procreate is the same drive to create. So mm. whether we are just letting it go and becoming victims of our lives, whereby when we don't have that sexual energy, like I've seen this in my clients as well, the guys that are fallen victim to like this mentality of making excuses, of blaming, of complaining. Mm. Like I've seen the correlation between porn addiction and that you know like so the more we can actually retain that energy the more we can use it to expand what is possible for us as well because at the end of the day that's like the one thing that uh, really sets humans apart is like the ability to creatively imagine a future that's mm -hmm. not there right now and if you don't have that energy then it's very hard to break out of where you are right now and you can't really fuel your imagination and think about where you want to be right? so. and out of the seven once you you cited so just to recap there was breathing eating movement sleep focus hormesis and um, retaining the ejaculation which one would you say had the most impact for you in terms of energy levels yeah so it's a constant balance like for me there might be a point where i'm doing everything right but i'm not sleeping well i might be doing everything right but i'm like ejaculating too much but it depends on what stage of life you uh, I've been in, but like recently I've seen that sleep is the most important thing because like right now it's the holidays and like different people are saying that, you know, like family dinners and then all like different occasions are taking place. So my sleep hasn't been as consistent, but sleep for me is the most important. Like if my sleep, if I wake up and sleep at the same time every single day, then my day tends to unfold way more optimally okay. than any other thing as well so i would say sleep for sure yeah i i feel that that's the that's the main pillar like even when you look at elizabeth blackburn's work on telomeres um i think that's the most that's the most important one in terms of um of having a longer lifespan is sleep more than nutrition more than the the rest and a quick question also on the um, on eating and the cycles do you feel like um so eating at a regular time is the most important yeah so another thing that i found is that the more i can extend the gap between my last meal and the time okay. i go on intend on going to sleep like if i can keep a uh, let's say three to four hour gap between that then my sleep tends to be okay. way more optimal as well because my food is digested but yeah, so that's like the first thing. And then the second thing is just to basically keep a window through which I can stay consistent in fitting my meals in, you know, rather than being just uh, all over the place and eating at okay. random and, times. And do you do, th have you looked into the number of meals a day? Like, can you do two meals a day, for example, as long as you keep that structure? Yeah, personally, that works for me. Two meals a day within a four to eight hour window. Like, it's flexible right now because it's like vacation and holidays and stuff like that. But like whatever works for you, whether it's two meals, whether it's three meals, like that's not the as important as the consistency within your first meal and last meal is fit within, you know? Mm. Um, okay. Uh, uh, that's, that's like so insightful and I'll, I'll have you uh, for another show to discuss <laughs> almost <laughs> each of them because that's really cool. I, I have a question on, you talked about external sources for energy but like food in a way, or even breath could be seen as external. So where do you consider it's like a stimulant? It's not good to have every day versus, you know, some food, I guess, like uh, uh, can give you good energy. So yeah, what's the, what's the border there? Yeah, man. So the main thing for me has been caffeine. And mm. the thing about caffeine is that it basically, caffeine mimics the effects of this, uh, neurotransmitter called adenosine and adenosine is what your brain releases when you're tired so what caffeine is actually doing is not giving you energy what it's doing is blocking the signal of adenosine okay so when it's blocking the signal of adenosine it's not like you're more energetic it's just that it's blocking the signal of you being tired mm -hmm. so when the caffeine runs out of your system that's when you have the crash so for me the line has been to draw it towards my consumption of caffeine at the end of mm -hmm. the day 
and you you would even advise against like green tea or low caffeine or well it really depends on your sensitivity to caffeine yeah. like for me i have a caffeine curfew whereby i don't consume any caffeine past like 12 p.m so mm. it depends on your own sensitivity like i know people who drink coffee at night they say that it doesn't have any problem on their sleep but then again i see them with these dark circles under their eyes so at the end of the day people will mm. do what they want but uh, caffeine curfews is something that has been very effective for me in terms of monitoring my own usage mm. yeah and what from it as well yeah in what you said yeah i really liked also the, the part on breathing like for me it's been a a big change since I, i'm thinking about breathing deeply in my be- belly i feel more calm Uh, also, I think you can use that for focus, right? Like for me, when it brings me back to the present moment. So I combine the health part and the and the focus part. So yeah, it's been a game changer. Almost like even um, I did an ayahuasca ceremony four or five months ago, and that really taught me so deeply how powerful breath is. Because it would like every time my mind would go to some dark places. Yeah. I'd go to the breath and I could feel the power of that. And now I'm trying to implement that in my everyday life. And um, you yeah. talked about movement too. I could add on um, the posture scene too, like being chest up and really s- so simple things like breathing deeply, um, belly, deep, be- be- deep belly breath, plus like having the chest up is that completely changes how I behave in the world, my confidence. Mm-hmm. And, and, Yeah. yeah, it completely changes your physiology, right? Like instantly you can bring yourself and anchor yourself to your center rather than mm. being caught up at the effect of external circumstances. So mm. yeah, that's a huge one. Like I used to use meditation as kind of an escape. Like, okay, I'm going to meditate now. But now it's like your meditation is a way of life. It's like that's a practice mm-hmm. and then showing yeah. up in life is like the test, you know? So like any time where I find myself getting off center, that's like an opportunity for me to practice presence, to get mm. back to my center. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend. She told me now, now my life is the meditation. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the goal, right? That's the goal. Yeah. For me, I still, I know I still need my meditation time. Like ideally it'd be like, okay, every meal, every conversation is a meditation. Um, But, you know, still needs a bit of training. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what does meditation mean to you? Um, well, to me, med- to me, there's mindfulness, which is a cultivating presence in my everyday life. And then meditation is that dedicated time where I sit and I really focus on that mindful practice. So, for example, eating mindfully to me is not meditation. Mm. To some people, it'd be meditation. But so for me, meditation is the mind training tool I use to be more present and cultivate mindfulness in my everyday life. But so meditation is not the goal. Being mindful and present in the, is the goal. Okay, and okay, meditation okay. is the tool to train myself to, to be better at that. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Because that's what ends up uh, causing a lot of confusion you know with language in general like there's yeah. so many words i mean so many different things yeah. with so many different people and then it's like two people can having a conversation but they're on completely different wavelengths in terms of what they're even talking about right mm. yeah and um so thanks mo because i want to keep this one relatively short but i think there's like so much information how can people get more information if they want to go more into details um, about all this Yeah, so they can uh, message me on Facebook, just m.me forward slash the Mo Salim, or they can go to mosalim.com to learn more. M O S A L E E M. And you still do like webinars that explain a bit more in details? Yeah, so the main thing right now is just enrolling clients into the program. So this is like a 12 week program which I created. It's uh, engineered towards helping men increase their masculine energy levels. Mm. So it's like called awaken your alpha. So it's like a three step. It's a three module course based on mental, physical and spiritual mastery. And the spiritual Mm. aspect comes down to the practicing of these tantric and uh, Taoist practices. So yeah, there's a, if people want to dive deeper into this, there's a blueprint that I've created. They can go to mostlim.com forward slash blueprint. They can opt in for it there. And mm-hmm. if they resonate with the content, then they'll have an opportunity to get on a call as well. So that's something that nice. 
think so. Yeah, that's fascinating. I feel like here we've touched a bit on the health part, but there's a whole conversation more philosophical around even what it means to be an alpha male in 2020. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because as I've like created more content and seen what people are actually vibing with, it seems to be that a lot of uh, men are actually the ones who are consuming the content who are confused about what it even means to be a man. And mm. maybe they resonate with uh, my view of things. Because for me, it's like to be a man is to live with virtue. You know, that's what the ancient mm. Stoics talked about as well. So virtue actually literally means manliness as well. But I'm sure that's a conversation for a different podcast. That mm -hmm. have, yeah. yeah, well, thank you so much, Mo. And thank you to everyone who listened. I'm sure you got tremendous value at least. I did. Uh, so thanks, Mo. Thanks, everyone. If you have a last word, Mo, I let you share with the listeners. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. And I'll see you soon. Yeah.